what are five of the official casper questions and what might be some expert responses to those that's what i'm going to do today in this video first hi my name is dr sarah Kleeb, and i'm an admissions expert at bmo so uh, we get a lot of students asking about these official CASPER questions and our responses to them. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for a little bit about what makes a good CASPER answer good. Uh, I'm going to give you some sample questions and prompts that you can practice with on your own. And at the end, I'll give you an ideal or model sort of answer for one of these prompts. So get comfy make yourself some tea or coffee or whatever uh, makes you happy because we're going to be here for a little bit, but it's a long road, but it's one worth going on. So first off, strong Casper answers have a number of relatively consistent features. Uh, doing this in every single prompt might not, not be entirely possible, but ideally these are some of the things that you want to make sure that you do. So first, and you'll notice this when I give my expert answer at the end, um, ideal responses or expert responses don't necessarily accept the prompt itself as the full or final say on the matter. Rather, uh, ideal answers will demonstrate an understanding of the information provided as potentially partial uh, or possibly even incorrect. So a lot of these prompts, and this is the same for MMI, they'll have assumptions sort of built into them. And you wanna take time to stand back from that and question some of those assumptions that might exist. Um, so showing that little bit of skepticism towards the prompt or the language I tend to, tend to use is putting pressure on the prompt itself demonstrates that you don't just act prematurely based on only the assumptions that you've been given, uh, that you'll follow up and confirm that information. And that kind of skepticism is a hallmark of critical thinking. Um, most problems are going to be more complex than they seem uh, just on the surface. And so demonstrating how you're going to sort through that information and gather additional information um, will highlight your ability to question assumptions, to be mature in your reflection, to seek out additional perspectives, resources, or other sources of knowledge. Um, if there's information presented to you and you in the role that you're given don't maybe know exactly how ideally to go about uh, finding more information, talking about who you would discuss this with. Are you going to form a, a multidisciplinary team of researchers? Are you going to consult with a, a colleague who's had more experience than you? Are you going to look into certain uh, texts in the workplace or in the school to see what best practices have already been demonstrated through that pre-existing literature? Any of those things really say a whole lot about who you are as a mature professional thinker. Next, uh, strong answers generally acknowledge that there are multiple concerns and parties that need to be considered and balanced in the response. So again, for a lot of these prompts, there's going to be a lot of different things going on and you need to not only uh, sift through that to prioritize what's most pressing that needs to be dealt with immediately, but also sort of indicate the other potential avenues that you might have to take in developing a full response. So by doing this uh, and establishing that balance of multiple needs or priorities shows your open-mindedness, your ability to hold on to multiple priorities and give each its due consideration. And talking about um, how you're going to do this using demonstrative prose to show how uh, you would take certain actions is a really great way of giving the evaluator sort of a window into who you are and how you're going to interact in a certain scenario. So as we're addressing these different say parties who need to be addressed, if there are individuals who are potentially vulnerable or who may have been uh, the victim of, of some um, you know violence or slight of some kind, demonstrating that you're going to speak in a non-judgmental and non-confrontational man uh, manner, saying that you sympathize with someone's dilemma or issue, discussing the ways in which you're going to actively listen and give support. All of those notes on your gestures, your demeanor, your tone um, will give you, uh, will give your 
your reviewer a more complete picture of who you are and how you carry yourself when you're interacting with others, particularly in tense or delicate situations. And, you know, a lot of these scenarios have sort of um, ethical tensions, personal issues, or otherwise sort of sensitive issues. And so you really want to make sure that the person who's evaluating your response has the clearest possible picture of you in that scenario. Um, you can't leave it up to their assumptions to fill in the gaps as to how you're going to communicate, how you're going to carry yourself, how you're going to interact with others. And last, a strong response will almost always illustrate a later follow-up, ensuring that the situation is truly resolved or making sure that such issues don't arise again in the first place. So again, you, here you demonstrate your understanding of the complexity of these kinds of issues and acknowledge that lasting change requires vigilance and follow-up. We can't just walk away and assume that everything's going to be okay. All right, so those are some tips that you can use along with our other resources on our blog for Casper to think through how to come up with ideal answers. So let me acknowledge my cat who is meowing in the background. Hello, buddy. Come here. Take a little mini cat break for about 10 seconds. Here he is. This little guy's making all kinds of noise behind me, so please don't mind him. He's our special guest today. Um, now let's talk about some of these prompts that you can practice with. So what I'll do, I'll read the prompt for you, give you the questions, and then you know you can use this later, come back to this and practice your answers given uh, the information that I gave you at the beginning. Other research you might want to do looking into our <laughs> advice for Casper and uh, my own expert response that I'll give at the end. So here, imagine this. You're a member of a study group and you observe members of your group having a very heated conversation. Uh, two of your group members, Mike and John, are confronting a third member, Sarah, about her what they see as her inconsistent contribution to the study group. Mike and John are upset that Sarah hasn't contributed to the study session today and accuse her of not being prepared. Uh, she defends herself, saying that she's been busy writing an important paper. So Mike and John inform her that they had the same paper due and despite that were able to show up prepared for this session. They accuse her of regularly coming to tutorials unprepared, suggesting she's only learning from the information that they've provided during the study sessions. Sarah informs them that she's been under a lot of stress and that they're not being very fair to her and she gets ready to leave because of what she calls their negativity. So the questions associated with this prompt are the following. Number one, you're a member of this study group and you haven't participated in the interaction so far, but now everyone in the group is looking at you. How would you diffuse this situation? So when I was saying earlier that sometimes these can have really sort of sensitive uh, topics, this is exactly what I was referring to. You would want to be really careful in how you talk about your de-escalation of the situation. We would need to acknowledge the validity of everyone's concerns, but we'd also probably want to speak privately if possible with Sarah to figure out what has been going on, what is giving her so much stress, what's been going on in her life that maybe hasn't allowed her to contribute. We don't know what's going on in her life. Uh, it could be something um, superficial or it could be something really significant. Um, the others are working under the assumption that this is just her blowing things off, but it looks like there might be more going on. We would need to gather more information and do so in a very um, delicate and sensitive way in order to figure out what's happening. Question two, do you agree with the two students who are upset with Sarah? Why or why not? Uh, and number three, what suggestions can you make to help the group function better going forward? So the second question, again, we're going to want to use some tact and some diplomacy. Um, we don't necessarily want to agree with either side, uh, these two students or Sarah, until we've gotten more information. We don't want to jump to any conclusions. Um, and in terms of suggestions, thinking proactively, just draw on your own life. What are some things uh, that you found have helped increase participation in group projects that you've done? Or if you've been the student who didn't always contribute so much to group projects, what could have been done to make you want to interact more? Use those as your inspiration for answering. All right, prompt number two. 
here you are sitting in on a conversation between two individuals, Tom and Jesse, your co-workers. Uh, Tom informs Jesse that he's having a tough time with a personal decision. He and his wife are expecting a child and his wife would like him to take paternity leave with her. He tells Jesse that the company is taking on this new project that he would lead and doing well on that project could significantly advance his career. Despite this excitement for parenthood, he's really struggling with uh, the decision between spending time with his family in the short term versus focusing on his career, which could ultimately benefit him and his family in the long term. So questions here. The first question, uh, what recommend, or would you recommend that he take per paternity leave? Why or why not? Again, a lot of factors to balance here. Now, you're not, of course, going to be making the decision for this individual. They want to know, um, what would you recommend? And so this would require a navigation of a couple of different possible scenarios and outcomes. You know, if uh, there are certain things taking place, then he might want to go one way. If something is completely different, he might want to go the other way. How you fill in those blanks depends a little bit on your experiences. Um, so instead of starting off by saying, you know, yes, I would recommend it or no, I wouldn't recommend it. Use that, um, that sort of uh, information gathering phase to take Tom to have a private conversation where you can ask some questions about uh, what his priorities are, what his partner's priorities are, um, and how those either do or don't align. And based on those responses, you would then determine, you know, well, if, you know, this sort of thing takes place, if it turns out that um, his partner is actually really understanding and didn't realize that the project was this big and that uh, the long-term benefits could outweigh the short-term gap by him not uh, being there for that parental leave, well then maybe he should take that opportunity. Um, on the other hand, if it turns out that, you know, he was really thinking just from the perspective of getting ahead at work and not really focusing on what those early crucial months mean in uh, the sort of development and flourishing of a young family, well, then he might want to, you know, exercise his priorities in a different direction. Um, question number two, what strategies could you offer to help him make a decision that he feels comfortable with? Again, this all comes back to the conversation that you're going to have with this individual. Um, we don't know exactly what his overall priorities are or whether there are other factors that we just aren't really privy to in this particular prompt. So um, certainly, you know, little strategies like coming up with a list of pros and cons, uh, bringing his partner into this uh, conversation uh, with potential mediators, or even asking advice from other people in the family or, or in his circle of colleagues and friends who may have had to um, make some decisions like this. All of those things would be applicable and useful ways of navigating this situation. And question three, maintaining work-life balance can be challenging. Why do you think people struggle to find that balance? Now that's a personal question, right? Just asking you about your opinion. It's not necessarily explicitly or specifically related to this prompt. They're just asking you a little bit more broadly, what thought have you put into maintaining that work-life balance? And why do you think people struggle to find this? You could also talk about you know, your own struggles with finding that balance and maybe some ways that you have worked around it or that you are in the process of um, sort of refining in, a, in uh, preparation, uh, thinking in advance of the kinds of uh, difficulties of balance that you might face yourself. I'm going to pause for one second. And I returned, sans cat. <laughs> All right, so moving on to prompt number three. Here, you're sitting in a meeting with two co-workers, Frank and Julia, um, and Frank wants to talk about a member of his team, Jason, with regard to some concerning behavior. Frank is concerned that Jason has been showing up late to work and has been seen dozing off during meetings. And despite this behavior, the team's overall performance uh, has been very positive. So Julia weighs in on the conversation saying that uh, the company encourages flexible working conditions where employees can maintain their own schedules as long as they maintain good performance with positive reviews. 
Frank uh, elaborates that Jason has been acting a bit distant lately uh, and has been avoiding personal questions about his family. So he's worried that this behavior could be a sign of something more serious going on. Uh, Julia seems dis uh, some, seems uh, concerned by this disclosure, um, and she informs Frank that, you know, as long as Jason hasn't shared any specific struggles uh, with Frank about any of these issues, that it would be something of a transgression of boundaries to approach Jason about personal matters. So, questions. Number one, what advice would you give Frank about his team member, Jason? So this is a question of professional boundaries to some extent and thinking carefully about how you might want to approach that um, is, is something that's it's really good to practice. These questions of personal and professional boundaries can be quite tricky uh, because of course we want to show concern for our team members both on the human level and on the, the practical level of you know ensuring that a business is running smoothly. But there are barriers that exist to protect all of us. Um, not all disclosures in such conversations uh, are going to be positive or, or beneficial in the workplace and that could cause tension. So you would really want to sort of think through how you're going to balance that sense of boundaries that are necessary to maintain in the everyday workplace versus that concern that you might have for your coworker. So um, you know, this would again be a place where you could step aside, see if you could um, have or set up a private meeting uh, where you would, uh, or whether you, you could if you know Jason or if Frank is closer to Jason, you could encourage him to set up such a meeting, um, creating that sort of safe, non-judgmental space to simply ask a few open-ended questions and make sure that, uh, that he's okay. Um, perhaps Jason is really just tired, um, maybe he's got insomnia, <laughs> maybe there's something um, small going on that could, you know, easily be resolved. If there are larger issues going on, say with his family or something like that, it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate as a co-worker to get involved, but pointing them towards resources that could help them in their personal life would be more appropriate. Question number two, do you agree that taking any additional action in this situation would be considered overstepping boundaries? Why or why not? So again, here you need to talk a little bit about what professional boundaries mean to you and why you would or wouldn't consider this an overstepping of those limitations. Um, if the intent behind finding out these details is to legitimately help a team member and thus also help the business. That's one thing to take into consideration. If it's just out of curiosity um, or for the purpose of gossip, that's a totally different consideration. Uh, and number three, Imagine you heard rumors that Jason was being bullied at work. Would this change your reaction to the situation? Again, you need to determine sort of what position you're ultimately going to take before you can decide whether that would, uh, would make a difference in your overall response. Um, if you think that uh, the boundaries that exist do give some leeway for um, some genuine engagement with the issue with the other person and some genuine support and pointing towards resources and things like that, then maybe your response wouldn't change uh, based on uh, this idea that Jason is perhaps being bullied. Um, but that's a decision that you have to make. What's important is that you're able to really think through the ramifications of your actions in either way, um, whether you're saying something or you're not, whether you're making that uh, open space for reflection or you're not, whether you're intervening or you're not, and the reasons behind all of that. Those are the things that you need to demonstrate uh, and that you need to think through as a mature professional. Uh, next, you are the captain captain of your high school basketball team. Your team has been preparing for or preparing all season for regional championships, which are now one week away. You get a call from your mother in distress saying that her sister has died unexpectedly. This sister, your aunt, uh, hasn't been close to the rest of the family and you barely know her. Uh, the funeral is the same day as your regional championships and the events are four hours apart by car and you don't have a driver's license. 
So this is a really tricky situation, one that a lot of people have uh, have dealt with or will have to do it, deal with at some point in the future. Um, so the first question, do you attend the funeral or the basketball game and why? This is a question about your priorities. And that's not a question that, uh, that you know, any of us can really answer for you. You need to think really carefully about what is the most important thing here. In either case, you have two people or two sets of people relying on you. Um, even if you don't know your aunt very well, that is your mom's sister. They have a long history and being there for family is very important. Being there for your team is very important as well. So you'd wanna really carefully detail how you're going to think through, again, the ramifications of your actions uh, and then make a decision. Uh, question two is describe a time when you had to make a similarly challenging decision. Again, this is a, a question about your own autobiography, your own life story. We've all had to make difficult cha or challenging uh, decisions at, at times in our lives. So talking about that decision, but really using that opportunity to reflect on the decision that you made. Was it the best decision, do you think? What lessons did you learn from having to make that decision? Those are important. And then question number three, what's your strategy for managing Con, uh, conflicting demands in your life and how did you develop this strategy so again you've probably gone through something like this before what did you learn from it what do you, what tools do you use when making this kind of really difficult decision and now our final prompt with questions and some full-fledged expert answers. I've tried to give you some tips, pointers, or things to think about for the other questions. I'll give you a full-fledged answer uh, to these. So, let me get some tea. All right, the prompt is this. You are an employee at a retail store and you overhear an interaction between a customer and another employee at the cash register. The customer is here to return an item. However, she doesn't have the receipt for the item uh, and claims to have paid in cash. Despite assurances by the customer that she really did buy the item at your store, your colleague informs the customer that while she can provide a store credit or an exchange, store policy does not allow for refunds of more than $20 without a receipt. Uh, the customer informs your colleague that she really needs a refund given that this was a birthday purchase for her daughter, uh, but now she desperately needs that money to buy her daughter's prescription medication instead. When the manager, or while the manager can override the store policy, she's away until next week. Your colleague turns to you for advice given that you've been working at the store for longer than she has. So a pretty common scenario, if you've had the, uh, the opportunity to work in retail or customer service, you know that this is uh, something that happens all the time, uh, but there's a lot at stake in this particular iteration of the scenario in terms of what this woman claims to need the money for. So question number one is, what do you tell the other employee? Go ahead and give the refund or abide by store policy and justify your answer. So if I was answering this, this would be my response. So as a fellow employee at the store, uh, the pressing issue here is that there's an ethical dilemma. I want to help the customer as best I can without compromising the store policy. Uh, before I make a decision on that matter, I would first need to gather some more information. So as I take this step, I would want to verbalize my appreciation for the customer's patience uh, and speak with her in a very non-judgmental, non-confrontational manner, demonstrating that I understand that she's in a really difficult situation and demonstrating my active listening uh, to her in um, acknowledging her concerns, uh, validating her responses, um, and even just giving uh, basic uh, body language clues like leaning in and, and nodding my head as she's speaking. If there's other customers around, uh, I would really want to try to take this conversation to a private location. Um, I don't want to embarrass the customer, make her feel uncomfortable. She's talking about a pretty personal issue, so I'd want to make sure I could make some safe space for disclosure if possible. Um, so in gathering information, I need to know when this customer bought the item, uh, confirm that she did buy it from this precise location and not some other uh, chain of our store. It's possible that she could have bought it months and months ago, even maybe years ago. Um, and as such, it just wouldn't be eligible for a refund. But that's information that we haven't been given in the prompt. 
Um, additionally, I want to look at the store's policy itself uh, to ensure that there are rules quite so strict uh, with regard to refunding items without a receipt. Um, in this scenario, I'm not a manager, so I need to look up those resources myself. Maybe there is a clause where store employees can return items without a receipt for a full refund based on their own discretion. Um, I also acknowledge that in this scenario, my manager is away, um, but I could always call a different branch of the store uh, where, who, where there might be a store manager available, um, and perhaps they could provide guidance, or if possible, maybe I could see if, it was, if I was able to call our own store's manager to see if I could get an approval to process the return. Um, based on whatever information I'm able to gather, if the customer did indeed buy this item from our location and I'm able to give them a refund in cash based on some discretionary rule or some leeway in the policy, uh, then I wouldn't hesitate to give the full refund. If I'm not able to process or provide a refund, I would apologize profusely. Um, however, I would also try to assist this customer in any way that I can. Um, she's currently going through a, a dilemma, and so I would encourage her to maybe try speaking uh, to a medical professional or seeking help at an emergency department if the prescription is required right away for a life-threatening condition. Um, they can't fill her prescription, but maybe they could give a dose of the medication in the meantime to buy some time. Also, I'd encourage her to talk to her pharmacist. They may be able to accommodate a payment plan for prescriptions or might have a generic form of the medication that could cost significantly less. Uh, for the future, I'd encourage her to always contact her family physician and make an appointment, given that they might be able to um, access certain kinds of social support programs for prescriptions if she's having consistent financial difficulties and doesn't have the um, coverage necessary for those kinds of prescriptions. As well, in mentioning her financial difficulties to her family physician, she might find that the doctor could prescribe a similar medication that's considerably less expensive than the current prescription that her daughter's taking. Um, perhaps the doctor may even have some samples of the medication, which can be given out at no cost. Right, so again, as in the beginning, what I said, uh, I've gathered more information. I've had to explore the space of the scenario a bit more because there's a lot of information that I didn't have that would influence how I move forward. So looking into the school's or the school, <laughs> the store's policy, looking into um, contacting others who have more experience than I have, um, understanding the full scope of what this particular customer is dealing with. All of those things were me finding more information. And ultimately, you know, there's going to be one or two ends to our, our interaction together. Either I am or I am not going to be able to provide the refund. In the case that I am, there is no problem further, you know, going further. Um, if I'm not, however, I still want to help this individual out. I can't do exactly what they're asking, but I can at least give some other advice or ideas that maybe they don't have um, and at least help them feel like we do genuinely care about her and her daughter's well-being on a human level, which is absolutely true. So question number two, as, uh, assume you advise the newer employee not to give the refund, but she does so anyway. Do you report this to your supervisor? Why or why not? So here it would depend on the store policy since upholding that policy is my duty as an employee. If there were some kind of discretionary rule whereby an employee can provide a refund given that they have a solid justification for doing so, then I wouldn't report her. I would instead encourage her to thoroughly document the event so that she can submit a report to our manager upon the manager's return. If it was clearly against the rules and my own advice was in line with the store policy and procedures, then I'd give her the opportunity to do the right thing and report her actions to the manager herself. Um, I would gently remind her that she does have a responsibility. Um, and that responsibility is at least in part as an employee. And so I would want to encourage her to uphold our store uh, policies and standards in that role. Um, I would follow up with her at some point if she, and if she hasn't reported the incident, then I would report it to the manager, right? So here I've gone through a, a standard process of, of, you know, giving the person the benefit of the doubt, which is to say first, see if what she did was actually more in line with store's policy than what I advised. That's entirely possible. I could have been wrong. 
Um, if it turns out that she did, you know, violate that policy, then I'm giving her the opportunity to do the right thing, which is to say, you did something you shouldn't have done, just, you know, go forward with it and, and tell the manager about it on your own. Oftentimes, being honest in these situations uh, is enough to keep things from really piling up, but, you know, we'll just have to see what happens in the situation. But ultimately, she's made, unfortunately, a poor decision that doesn't align with the um, role that she has as an employee at this location. And so if she hasn't followed up, I'm going to have to do so myself. Question three, if you are asked to establish a policy around refunds for a new store, what aspects would you take into consideration? So here with regard to setting a refund policy, my goal would be to provide the best shopping experience for our customers without compromising the store from a business perspective. Prior to establishing the new policy, I would want to hear from our customers first to learn what they want to see in a return policy, um, what kinds of policies they think might be fair. I may not be able to implement all of these, but hearing from our customers first is a good way to really understand what the customer uh, business relationship looks like. So I would get that information through maybe a survey uh, with our customers trying to determine what seems fair and appropriate from their perspective. Um, I'd also send a similar survey to um, other employees, to upper management to get their input on it. And I would look into refund policies at other stores to see um, how a proper balance between customer and business needs is met. My own priority would be making the return policy transparent, uncomplicated, and in the best interest of the shopper. With regard to transparency, I would clearly outline the, the, the return policy on our store's website and place a copy by the store's cashier. I would have training sessions so that employees can learn and disclose those policies at the point of purchase. With regard to ensuring the policy is uncomplicated, I would construct a policy that is simple, universal, and that doesn't include a lot of rules. Um, ideally, I would want maybe four to five rules to the policy that um, as firmly as possible protect both the customer and our store. Additionally, I'd want to provide an electronic as well as a printed receipt to our customers so that they can access their receipt from anywhere. That way, uh, if the issue uh, in the scenario comes up, uh, it would be much, likely, much less likely to arise in the future that she would have a receipt on her regardless of how long ago she had purchased the item. So with the customer's consent, I could establish an in-house database as well uh, that where items that are purchased by a customer can be looked up in our system. This would be a service provided to our customer. They would have to enroll um, of their own volition, given laws around privacy and maintaining their personal information in our database. Um, finally, with regard to having the policy lean more in favor of the customer, I would have a no questions asked policy if they are returning one of our pr products so long as the other rules have been followed. Right, so in each of these, I've found different ways to collect information to demonstrate some of the things that are lacking or missing in the prompt that I would need to push on or, or um, ask questions about more fully. I've demonstrated not just what I would do, but how I would do those things, giving an impression of who I am in that space uh, through narrative devices that allow the reviewer to uh, imagine me going through these activities. And I've always tried to balance the competing um, tensions, priorities, or needs that exist um, by taking them into account and offering some different uh, possible ways of moving forward depending on how things ultimately play out. So feel free to use some of those tips as well as our others to go back through and answer the prompts that were early in this video. Uh, that's about it for me. So I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you found it helpful. If so, please do go ahead, like it, share it with a friend who might benefit from it. Be sure to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, follow us on Facebook and look for us on a variety of other social media. If you'd like us to help you, click the link that should appear either above or below this video to see our programs and schedule a free initial consultation. We'll set you up with one of our admissions experts to answer any questions you might have and get you started on your preparations. We have programs to suit any of your needs and we are happy to work with you to determine which plan will support you most effectively. As ever, thank you so very much for your time. Take good care and I'll see you next time.